We're honored to have Young Chang with us today. Young was born in China and she now lives in London. She's the author of the international bestseller, Wild Swans, which describes the plight of her family in 20th century China through the eyes of three women or three generations of women, I should say. Um, she's written a number of books about important, feature, uh, important figures in China. Um, and in her latest book, Big Sister, Little Sister, Red Sister, she tracks the lives of the three Song sisters and their influence in 20th century China. Please join me in welcoming Yang Cheng. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I think I would first of all say something about how I became a writer. And then I will show some slides which are from the illustrations of my latest book, um, Big Sister, Little Sister, Red Sister, Three Women at the Heart of 20th Century China, um, and talk about that latest book of mine. Now, I, I was born and grew up in China. Um, I loved writing when I was a child, but when I was growing up in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, it was impossible even to dream of becoming a writer. And in those years under Mao's tyranny, nearly all writers were condemned, sent to the gulag, driven to suicide, some were executed. I mean, even writing for oneself was dangerous. I remember writing my first poem on my 16th birthday in 1968. Um, right, I just wanted to see whether that was for me. Okay, I wrote my first poem on my 16th birthday in 1968. It was in the middle of the Cultural Revolution and the books were burned across China. Um, but I wrote, I wrote this poem, I was lying in bed, polishing my poem when I heard the door banging. Um, the um, red guards had come to raid our flat, to raid our apartment. If they discovered my poem, I would get into trouble and my parents, would, my family would get into trouble. So I had to quickly rush to the bathroom to tear up the poem and flush it down the toilet. And that ended my first venture in writing. But the desire to write never left me. And in the following years, I was exiled to the edge of the Himalayas and worked as a peasant and as a barefoot doctor. And then I became a steel worker and a, an electrician. When I was spreading manure in the paddy fields, when I was checking electricity supplies on top of the electricity poles, I was always writing in my head with an imaginary pen but I couldn't put pen to paper. And then in, in 1976, Mao died and China began to change. And in 1978, for the first time um, under communist rule, scholarships for going abroad were awarded on academic basis. I sat for a national exam, I did reasonably well. So I became one of the first group of 14 people to come and study, to go and study in the West, uh, in Britain. So when I got my doctorate um, in 1982, um, four years later, um, because I, I, I was so lucky I left China early. Um, I became the first person from communist China um, to get a doctorate from a British university. When I arrived in Britain, I then could write, but it was at that moment the desire to write left me. 
because I had come to a completely different world. Um, it was like landing on Mars. Everything was new. You know, my, my fellow students and I were wearing the Mao suit. We were not allowed to go out on our own. We had to move in a group. Um, and we were quite a sight in the London streets. And I, I just loved this, this new world. And I wanted to spend every minute enjoying the new life. Um, to write for me would be to look backward and inward about a past I wanted to forget all about. In the Cultural Revolution, my father, um, was one of, who is one of the few who spoke up to Mao as, against the Cultural Revolution. He was arrested, tortured, driven insane, um, and he died in the, very tragically, and prematurely, prematurely. And my beloved grandmother, who really brought us up, also died in the Cultural Revolution. And their deaths were the most painful spot in my heart. And I wanted to forget all about those. So I, I didn't, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to write. I didn't want to write for 10 years. And then in 1988, my mother came to London to stay with me. And this was her first trip abroad. And, and for the first time, she told me the stories of her life and stories of my grandmother, her relationship with my father. And my mother, you know, my mother stood up for my father in the Cultural Revolution. She suffered so much because of this because um, she was under tremendous pressure to denounce my father, and she refused. As a result, she went through over a hundred of these denunciation meetings. Um, she was made to kneel on broken glass. She was paraded in the streets when children spat at her and threw stones at her, and, but she survived. And, um, and then she came to London and, and she had so much to say to me and she stayed with me for six months. And she talked every day. So by, and when I was out working, she talked into a tape recorder. So by the time she left London, she had left me 60 hours of a tape recording. And, after, when I was listening to my mother, I, I kept saying to myself, I've got to write all this down. And, um, and, then, and then I realized how much I wanted to be a writer and how much I had always wanted to be a writer. And it all also seemed that my mother seemed to know that I had... Um, I had um, this unspoken dream and she was um, trying um, what she could to help me fulfill my dream because otherwise why would she talk into a tape recorder you know when I was not there and um, so I, I sat down, I transcribed my mother's tapes, and I thought about my past and, um, and all these things I had been writing in my head with an imaginary pen. And I wrote Wild Swans, the story of um, my grandmother, my mother, and myself, um, while our story reflects the history of 20th century China. And so Wild Swans was published in 1991. Um, I, uh, and I, it changed my life. Um, I became a writer. Um, so after that, I went on to write a biography of Mao um, with my husband, John Halliday who's half English, half Irish. And, you know, writing Wild Swans um, took me two, two years, two and a half years. But writing this biography of Mao took John and me 12 years. We did um, research 
all over the world. Um, we interviewed nearly everyone who had interesting dealings with Mao, um, including, you know, in America, former President uh, Bush, um, Ford, um, Kissinger, um, etc. And, and um, we Chong and I divided our language, um, divided our research by language, because we worked in 28 archives all over the world. And we divided our um, research work. And um, because I'm Chinese, so I dealt with the Chinese language sources. And Zhang, um, who unfortunately speaks many languages, so he was landed with the rest of the world. And for 12 years, we, we had tremendous fun. We worked tremendously hard, but we had tremendous fun. And we caught a window of opportunities. And in the 1990s, Yeltsin opened the archives of, the, um, of, of Russia. And in China, they, it was relatively open for research impossible now today. Um, but in those years, I mean, you know, Mao's um, people who knew Mao were still alive. So I interviewed over 200 of um, people who knew Mao in their circle and other historical witnesses. And after we wrote the, our biography of Mao came out in 2005, um, I translated into Chinese, which was published in um, Taiwan, Hong, Hong Kong, um, then in 2006. Um, and then I wrote a biography of the Empress Dowager Cixi, the woman who brought the concubine, imperial concubine, who brought China from a medieval society into the modern age. And she was the first modernizer in China. And of course, she's been maligned for a hundred years because um, she, she was a woman. She couldn't rule legitimately. And, um, um, and um, she... Uh, and, and her successors just wanted to wipe, to blame all the historical um, problems um, of China uh, on her. I, I first got interested in her because my grandmother had bound feet, you know, the crushed and bound feet, which women had in those years. And she, um, my grandmother lived in pain all her life. When I was a child, I, I saw that. Um, but when, we, I, when I grew up in China, we were under the impression that the communists uh, got rid of foot binding. But when I was writing Wild Swans, I realized that it was Empress Dowager Cixi who first um, who first banned the foot binding. And so that got me very interested in her. And I had um, I spent another six years writing a biography of her. And then after that, um, I wrote the biography of the three Song sisters, big sister, little sister, red sister. Um, I, was, I first got interested in them because I wanted to know what happened in China in the 40 years between the death of Empress Dowager Cixi and Mao seizing power. Because the last project of the Empress Dowager was to turn China into a constitutional monarchy with an elected parliament. She'd done, she'd made all the programs and set the ball rolling and, um, and made the schedule. But then 40 years later, Mao seized the power and plunged China into a totalitarian abyss. And what, what happened in those 40 years? The three sisters and their husbands, Sun Yat-sen, the so-called, the so-called father of China, because he was the first person 
to promote republicanism. And Chiang Kai-shek, the ruler of China before Mao seized the power and uh, threw him out of the mainland China um, to Taiwan. And their stories, the, three, the stories of the three women and their husbands are the stories of the 40 years, why you know, China went from the nostalgia to Mao. And more than the 40 years, because they lived very long lives and their lives really cover the whole of 20th century China. Um, and, uh, and they are at the center of power in China. And so I'm just now going to show some, um, to show you some pictures um, in, my, in my book, um, which, uh, I mean, tell the stories of the three sisters. So that's the cover of the book. Now, the woman sitting in the middle is the, is the mother of the Song sisters. And she came from an extraordinary family, the first Christian family in China. And a district in Shanghai is named after her family. Um, big sister standing and to her right um, and, and red sister with a hat. Now, this is their father, Charlie Song, and he also had an extraordinary life. He went to um, America in the late 1870s as basically a coolie, but he ran away and ended up in the American South. And he was adopted by the Southern Methodists and became the first person and to become a Methodist. And he, he spent seven years in life and um, he basically was, he fell in love with uh, America. And um, he, then after seven years, he went back to China and became a preacher and then a businessman in Shanghai. He made lots of money. And with the money, what he most wanted to do was to send his children, three daughters, as well as sons to America to receive an American education. Now, the eldest daughter, Eileen, went to America when she was 14 in 1904. And she was the first um, young woman to come from China and receive education in America. They went to Wesleyan University in Georgia. Now, the second daughter is the red sister, I mean, not known as the red sister at the time. She was educated also in Wesleyan and she came back to China and she fell madly in love with Sun Yat-sen, the man, you know, whatever you can see in the picture. And she, they wanted to get married, um, but her parents, were furiously against the marriage um, because Sun Yat-sen, as you can see, is a lot older than she. Mm, she was better in her 20s and he, he was in his 40s. And he had a wife and concubines and children. And basically he was a womanizer. So, um, so her parents were against the marriage and they locked her up in her room upstairs and she, cl she climbed out of the window and boarded on the ship to, to, for, to go to Japan and married him there. And this was 1915. But in a few years time, she was, she was terribly disappointed. And in 1922, the couple were surrounded by Sun Yat-sen's political enemies and with soldiers. And Sun Yat-sen wanted to flee and she was passionately in love and she, 
she basically she wanted to die for him. And so she asked him to leave without her. She would stay behind to cover his escape. But what she didn't realize was that after Sun Yasian arrived in safety, he still didn't want her to leave. He wanted her to stay there and to draw not, to, not only to draw enemy fire, but to give the enemy the impression that he was also there. So the, this, the enemy's attack would become a big war. And so he could have an excuse to launch fire on the enemies. And, and then she, eventually she managed to escape and he didn't lift a finger to help her in those three days and three nights. And, um, and she had a miscarriage on the way and was told that she could never have children again. And she, this was devastating for her because she loved children. And this became a lifelong emotional problem for her. And then Qingling then was totally disillusioned with her hero, but then she decided not to divorce him. And instead she wanted to do deals with him. The deal she most wanted to do was to allow her to become a public figure herself. And here you can see she is standing on the platform with Sun Yasian behind the table. And this was the founding ceremony of the Wang Po Military Academy in 1924. Sun Yasian, who pioneered republicanism, wanted to be, to be what he called the great president of Republican China. But he didn't want any elections, I mean, which, which was happening since the founding of Republican China in 1922. And he, he was the first person who said power comes out of the barrel of the gun. Um, but the West declined to help him. Then he turned to Soviet Russia. And it was the Soviet Russia who built an army for him with the Wangpo Military Academy to train the officers. Chiang Kai-shek to Sun Yat-sen's right was made the um, head of the Wangpo Academy. So um, after Sun Yat-sen died in 1925, Chiang Kai-shek was actually anti-communist. So after Sun Yat-sen died, Chiang Kai-shek turned on the communists and split from Russia. And this, in nine, this picture um, taken in 1927 was, is perhaps the only really happy picture that with the three sisters together. Um, the sisters were split by their political beliefs. Big sister Eileen sitting in the middle, and the little sister um, Mei Ling um, standing behind her in the light, uh, uh, Chong San. Both of them were also anti communist, and so they sided with Chiang Kai shek. Whereas Qing Ling in the dark gang was converted, Madame Sun Yat sen, she is. And, and she was converted by Sun Yat-sen's Russian Soviet advisors to be a Leninist. And so she was a communist and the two, the, the three sisters were, it, it were split by two political camps that were fighting a, a, a life and death war um, over the years. Little sister Mailing married Chiang Kai-shek in December 1927. This was their wedding day in Shanghai. And this is the couple on their honeymoon. But little sister Mailing was soon was soon disappointed or disillusioned with her life in Chiang Kai-shek. What she didn't realize was that 
uh, what life what life was like with Chiang Kai Shek. Chiang Kai shek basically started his political career as an assassin. He assassinated Sun Yat-sen's main political rival, and that caught the eye of Sun Yat-sen, who made him, who then that he that's why Chiang Kai shek was able to become Sun Yat-sen's Sun Yat-sen's successor. As a result of his assassination attempts on other people, Chiang Kai-shek was also pursued by assassins. And some assassins went into the marital room near their bed. And as a result, little sister Mei-ling suffered a miscarriage. And like her sister, and Qingling, she could also could never have children. So she was um, in depression for seven years. And Chiang Kai-shek loved his wife and wanted desperately to pull her out of depression. In 1932, he gave her a birthday present, a necklace. But as you can see, this is no ordinary necklace. It encircled a whole mountain. And basically, Chiang Kai-shek had these French pine trees planted. And these trees, uh, which formed the chain, and these trees co changed the color in a different way from the local trees. And so in the autumn, late autumn, early December, they form a distinct um, necklace. And the jewel of the necklace is a beautiful palace, um, which is, as you can see, with the green tiles which sparkle under the sun, looking like a real jewel. But it's really a palace and it's called the Meiling Palace outside Nanjing. Now, um, big sister Eileen was the person who made, who introduced the couple um, together. And then she was, she became Chiang Kai-shek's unofficial main advisor and made herself one of the richest women in China. And she also made her husband, H.H. H. Kong, Chiang Kai-shek's prime minister and the finance minister for many years. And meanwhile, red sister Qingling went into exile in Russia. And this is her in the Caucasus with her comrades. And the man standing to her left, is Deng Yanda, who was a very charismatic man with leadership qualities. In fact, Stalin wanted to make him the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, which Russia, which Moscow founded. And, but he said to Stalin, you know, he didn't even believe in communism. And, and so then it was after that, that Stalin settled on Mao. And so Deng Yanda fled in Berlin and Qingling joined him there and they fell madly in love. And Deng Yanda wanted to form a third party, a party that was different from the communists and the nationalists. And he went back to China to form that party and he became the biggest threat to Chiang Kai-shek. And Chiang Kai-shek, had him secretly executed. And this made Qingling hate Chiang Kai-shek really with all her heart and mind. And she, so to, to defeat Chiang, to bring down Chiang Kai-shek became her lifelong goal. And she, so she passionately, she joined the communists the secret, as a secret member, and she collaborated with Mao to, to, def, to destroy Chiang Kai-shek's regime. And even though they spent the destruction of her whole family. 
Now, in 1937, the war against Japan started, and this is um, little sister Mailing as the first lady of nationalist China, and she was visiting wounded soldiers. And she made a triumphant visit to America, and this was uh, her addressing Congress. The standing ovation lasted many minutes. Here she is sitting in the middle in the Hollywood Bowl, um, giving us to give a speech to 30,000 people. And the man sitting to her right is her nephew, David. Of the three sisters, only Eileen had children. And David was Eileen's oldest son. And basically, big sister, um, loved her little sister, and uh, she he knew how much little sister missed having children. She basically gave two children, one son and one daughter, to Mei Ling to be her like uh, her adopted children. And I don't know whether you can see this this person on the far on the other side um, of the first row. And she was a Jeanette. Eileen's daughter, kind of like adopted daughter of Mailing, and she was gay and unusual for those years. And she didn't try to hide her um, identity. Instead, she flaunted it. She always wore men's haircut and men's clothes. So in America, President Roosevelt called her my boy. And the Chiang Kai-shek's at a Cairo conference talking to President Roosevelt and the Prime Minister Churchill. And because there is a wartime united front and the th three sisters were back together in China's wartime capital, Chongqing. Here are they, mm, here they are with Chiang Kai-shek. And you can see Qing Ling, the red sister, stood away from the others. And she also made sure she never smiled in Chang, when Chiang Kai-shek was in the picture. And this, these are the three sons, the three brothers with their wives. And this is after the victory against the Japan. Chiang Kai-shek's portrait was hung on Tiananmen Gate, where Mao's portrait is today. Now, a civil war between the communists and the nationalists immediately started, and Mao beat Chiang Kai-shek. In 1949, Chiang Kai-shek flew to Taiwan, and just before that, he visited his ancestral home, this was him walking with a, with a walking stick, walking out, out of the family temple. And the man at the front to his right, the man with a hat, is Chiang Qingguo, Chiang Kai-shek's only blood son. Qingguo was held hostage in Russia for 11 years. Chiang Kai-shek was desperate to get his son and the heir back. And the Jingguo was uh, thrown into the gulag and, you know, really went through hell. And Chiang Kai-shek also knew that Stalin could kill him at any time. So he was desperate to get his son back. And he then did offer, basically, a secret deal with Stalin. He traded the survival of the Chinese communists and the Red Army for the return of his son. So in the 1930s, particularly during the Long March in the mid 1930s, when Chiang Kai-shek could have wiped out the Red Army, he didn't. And as a result, his son was returned, but he lost China. And they were in mainland, they were in um, Taiwan. And after Chiang Kai-shek died in 1975, Qingguo became his successor. 
and it was Qing Kuo who, who ended Chiang Kai-shek's dictatorship and started the ball rolling for democracy, which Taiwan is today. And the Chiang Kai-shek's um, eating, you know, under a portrait of, of himself. And now Qingling, stand, Qingling standing on Tiananmen Gate with Mao on the one side, with Zhou Enlai, she's a shorter woman, with Zhou Enlai to her right. And after Zhou Enlai, it was Deng Xiaoping, the paramount leader after Mao. Qingling became Mao's right, vice chair in communist China, and she collaborated with Mao throughout her life. And this was her, the shortest in the lineup. Um, in 1976, at Mao's memorial service on Tiananmen Square, she was being helped by a member of her staff. And you might notice those gaps in the picture. Actually, when, when the um, memorial service took place, the gang of four, Mao's wife and uh, th the three, uh, three, of three of her, her three associates were still alive and in power. But by the time the picture was published, they had gone gone to prison. Um, so the editor, um, there was nothing the editor could do but to erase these people from the picture, leaving conspicuous gaps. Um, now, you may ask, um, what's Elvis doing in this picture? I mean, you know, what's he to do with the Song sisters? Well, the lady with him is Deborah Paget, um, the leading lady in Elvis's first film, Love Me Tender. And, and apparently Elvis proposed to her, but she turned down the king to marry um, Eileen's youngest son, Louis. And and uh, and here is uh, me <laughs> with uh, Deborah Paget um, in her eighties, still you know going very strong, looking very beautiful, and um, um, uh, I'm sorry, Gregory, Gre Gregory, Gregory is the only son of um, is uh, the only grandson of Eileen. And therefore, he is the only blood descendant of the three sisters. And he treasures his privacy and, um, and, and had no desire to be the keeper of the legacies of the, of the, of the Song sisters. Now, and this is a mailing aged about 100. She died in 2003 and aged 105. She lived to see three centuries. So that's the brief story of the, uh, of the sisters. And um, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Young. That was really a wonderful walk back through the, the books. Um, I've read both Wild Swans and Big Sister, Little Sister, Red Sister, and enjoyed them very much. So um, thank you for that. I'm, um, you know, my I, my friend Sue from our book club asked me to ask you hmm. if you know if any of your books are being used as learning tools in schools or universities. Um, I I don't know about in about America. I think in oh yet I'm I certainly people in America told me then uh, teachers and they recommended um, my books to their students. And I certainly, I know in England, in Britain, for example, um, Wild Swans was not only taught, um, but also it was in some tests, some examination um, papers. Um, so some, but not, um, I, 
Well, I that that's what that that's what I know. Okay. Now, when my book group read Wild Swans, um, many of us it was really our introduction to communist China and um, an understanding of what life was like on, at that time. And one person actually said, "I think I understand China now." And it's, I'm sure it's a lot more complex than that, but the book was just so descriptive of what people went through during that time. It was really wonderful. Well, I'm very pleased. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah. So someone um, is asking where you learned English. Um, huh. Did you learn it when you got to Britain yeah. or did you already know English? Well, I knew some English uh, when I arrived in Britain in 1978. I, you know, I was in the secondary school um, for one year when the Cultural Revolution started and when all the schools were closed in China. As I said, books were burned, schools were closed for many, many years. And I learned a little bit of English then, but of course, I mean, nothing really. But in in 1973, universities began to reopen. So I was able to go to Sichuan University to learn English. But learning English under Mao is very different from the normal, how one normally learns English. To start with, in those years, China was completely closed from the outside world. You know, I'd never seen a foreigner when I was, when I started to learn English. And there were no, uh, we had no teachers, uh, no foreign teachers, and the Chinese teachers had never seen foreigners themselves. So our textbooks were um, written by these teachers who'd, who'd, learned, who'd learned English without talking to foreigners, English speaking people. And so they were direct translations of Chinese texts. The first lesson was inevitably in those years, long live Chairman Mao. And uh, the second lesson was uh, greetings. In those years in China, when we met each other, we say, which means, where are you going? Have you eaten? So those were the English greetings. I learned. So when I first arrived in Britain, I went around and asked people where they were going and whether they had eaten. <laughs> and before I arrived in England in 1978, the only foreigners I had seen were some sailors in a port in South China, where we as English language students were sent to practice our English. As far as we were concerned, and these sailors were our only hope. Um, so we were so keen to talk to them. We would literally, we, we, we sat in the only restaurant, in the only club on, in, the, um, in the harbor. And we grabbed the sailors as soon as they came on shore. Of course, we had no idea what must be in their mind. And, and so, um, so that's how I learned, uh, I learned English. Um, oh, yes. I mean, of course, in those years, um, we, um, the, all the, the, if I was reading, uh, although I, we were learning English, but we would be punished if we were seen to be working too hard on English, this language of the enemies. And so if I was reading an English language book, and if somebody came along, I had to quickly to cover it with a newspaper. Um, so that's how I learned to first learn the English when I, before I arrived in Britain. Wow, a harrowing story. But, the, but of course, you know, in Britain, um, then I was, um, um, earlier I was just saying how I, how I enjoyed arriving in Britain, you know, coming from that world, landing in Britain was like landing on Mars, you know, everything was new. And I was dying to go out. I must be the first person to go out without being with a group 
because China was changing, you know, in the late 1970s. Um, and, um, you know, gradually the rules were not so strict now, so I, I could sneak out. And I was the first person to go into an English pub or bar because the Chinese language for a bar is jiu ba, which in those years suggested somewhere indecent with nude women gyrating. And so we were specifically told not to go into a pub. And of course, I was torn with curiosity. And one day I sneaked out of the college, I darted across the road, I walked into a a bar pushed the door open. Of course, I saw nothing of the kind, only some old men sitting there drinking beer. And I was rather disappointed, of course. Um, <laughs> so I, I had to, that year in London, before I went to York University to do my doctorate in linguistics. And that first year was just unbelievably exciting. Wow. Well, uh Karen asks a question, with several mm -hmm. years since you published the book on Mao, is there anything you would add now? I, I, <laughs> I have not, I'm not, certainly, I mean, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, the, the thing is this, actually after that book was published in 2005, you know, I, then I translated into Chinese 2006, in terms of research, I mean, China was downhill. I mean, we, we were the, in the 1990s. I mean, that was the golden period of research. And I don't think many new materials have come out have surfaced. And in any case, I have been very busy with my other books. Um, I, I, I very rarely go back to, my, to the books I've already written because, um, you know, I, I, want to get, I want to get on with my next book. Um, and, and so that's that. Uh, anyway, mm, mm, the answer is no. <laughs> well, with this three books, sorry, I feel that, I actually feel very proud. I feel that I have written a trilogy of modern China and its main characters. The, the modern China, starting with Empress Daoja Cixi, going through the Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek period with the three sisters and Mao, and of course Mao's legacy. Um, so I, um, uh, I've been very busy. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the characters in Big Sister, Little Sister, Red Sister. Hmm. Um, I started reading about Sun Yat-sen and I thought I was gonna like him until I read more about him. And one of my book group um, friends is a history teacher. And she said she had read Sun Yat-sen's Sen's book years ago. And she thought he was wonderful until she read Big Sister, Little Sister, Red Sister, at which time she's not so crazy about him. And, um, and in general, I have to say that a lot of the characters from my perspective weren't very, um, um, attractive to me. You know, I, I felt like they um, had a lot of negative aspects to their personalities. And I was wondering, is that something like my Western interpretation of these people? Or do you share that interpretation of them and their actions? I definitely share your interpretation. Well, the thing <laughs> is, you know, bear in mind, these are all people at the center of power. In the, mm -hmm. at the center of um, of power, and they are sort of political animals at the center of power. They are not role models. They are they. they I mean, I think inevitably. Um, I mean, in that world, inevitably, they are. Um, they can't be very attractive. I mean, the thing is this, about Sun Yat-sen, I actually knew very little about him because he was, he maybe still is in, to a large extent revered across the Chinese speaking world. 
revered by the nationalists as well as by the communists. Well, the communists didn't, it was a bit ambivalent about him because they really wanted Mao to be the father of modern China, but they, they also wanted to take back Taiwan. So they, under the nationalists, they, they sort of said they revered Chiang Kai, uh, the Sun Yat-sen. Um, and then I actually, I started wanting to write a biography of Sun Yat-sen um, because I wanted to, um, because both Cixi, now, by the way, Cixi was the exception. I, her reputation was, is awful. I mean, she is portrayed still today as the tyrant, the, the, the wicked woman who dragged China behind, who was responsible for all China's troubles. But in fact, during my research, I, I realized all that is not at all true. I mean, she brought modernity to China and um, she brought women's liberation to China. Um, and, um, and she wanted to turn China into a democracy. And she said the ball rolling. So China, basically, China had its first democratic election the year after she died, within a few months of her death, because she laid the groundwork, um, she paved the way. And I was, and, and all that was starting with being an imperial concubine, with women having no position, I mean, no right to be a public figure. And, um, and, and she, you know, when she started, she couldn't even see her officials face to face. That's what women were not supposed to do. She had to um, have her audience from behind a throne, um, uh, behind a screen. And from that position, I mean, she was remarkable. And as a politician, she was remarkable. Now, okay, now, um, right. Now, the Sun yat and then I realized, particularly as I discovered, I pieced it together as I discovered how he treated his wife, you know, how he really wanted her to die. I mean, for his political career, I mean, her death would be, I mean, I mean, he, he didn't design it, but I mean, he didn't mind at all I mean, he, of her dying. And also for just to, you know, for himself to be the president of China. And he didn't like democracy. He didn't want, he, because he knew he couldn't be elected. Um, he was a dictator from the start. I mean, his comrades, you know, couldn't stand him and, you know, whatever. I mean, he knew this. I mean, he was clashing with the provisional um, parliament to, when the, as soon as the republic was founded. I mean, she, he wanted them to obey him and they wouldn't. I mean, so they had to clash. And they, so he realized that democracy wasn't for him. Um, I then, both in terms of private life, um, and also the way he treated his concubines and so on. Um, well, the, the details are in the book. I mean, he was quite uh, amoral. And um, then in terms of his public life as a politician, he wrecked China. He didn't mind wrecking China for himself to be the president. And he, for this, he brought in Soviet Russia. And he was the first person, and he and his successor, Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek, used the military force built up for them by Russia and the arms, etc., to overthrow a democratically elected Beijing government in 1928. So China had a brief period of 16 years of democracy. <clears throat> and Chiang Kai-shek was the first dictator in Republican China. And he was able to do it because of Sun Yat-sen. So, I mean, you know, he was quite awful. And uh, when I start, and then I decided that actually his three wives were much more interesting. And, you know, Sun Yat-sen in so many ways was so like Mao. You know, I don't want to, I didn't want to write another Mao. And I, I so I then wrote about the, the three sisters. Thank you. So I have a, a um, statement from Virginia. She says, thank you for the wonderful talk. 
I was able to read your book a few months ago and, and, to, and appreciated you shedding some light on the history of modern China through the lives of the Sung sisters. My father was a friend of Sung Qingling, um, mm. whom he met in, I don't know how to pronounce this, Chongqing, maybe? Yes, um, yes, yes. That's the wartime capital. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah he She's was the US Army. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. mm. Yes, so he was in the army and he met her there um, uh. and they became friends. Uh. Uh, mm. Benjamin says, uh, thank you very much for your time and your books, Young. Um, I'd like to know if you found your time in the fields of Ningying more challenging than your time living with your family in Chengdu or vice versa. And you mean during the pandemic, uh, challenging, sorry, mm -hmm. and no. No, um, compa comparing yeah. your time in the fields of Ning, um, Ningnan mm -hmm. with your time living in Chengdu, which did you find more challenging? And in those years, back in my um, teenage days, <laughs> in those years, actually, you know, Chengdu, of course, Ningnan is in the mountains on the edge of the Himalayas. And I was exhausted um, all the time, you know, all the physical labor and so on. And it was, life was in danger anytime because all these precipices, I mean, you know, quite a few people from my school died there. And uh, I was 16, um, was then 17, um, 16, sorry. Now, but for me, I, you know, I so dreaded Chengdu because that was um, the, um, in a cultural revolution, all these denunciation meetings, violence, witnessing my teacher being denounced, um, you know, um, being, you, you know, at these ghastly denunciation meetings, you probably saw some photos. I mean, when the, the um, victims were stood on the stage, when their arms were ferociously twisted to the back, their heads were ferociously pushed down, they were kicked and beaten. My mother was in this, um, at these denunciation meetings, subjected to the denunciation meetings uh, over a hundred times. And and I, you know, life was such a nightmare. Um, I, I, so it's not, um, which was why I didn't want to write um, a book for 10 years, because to just, I mean, I was having nightmares often at night, you know, just the thoughts of, of those um, and these ghastly um, pictures, you know, horrible scenes haunted me. Um, so I, I'm afraid I, you know, I had no particular feeling for Chengdu, but of course my, I, I, that, that's enough for this. Yes. Sounds like they were equally awful. Chengdu, of course, is where my mother is today. She is uh, coming up to 90. Now she's, her head is, her mind is still very clear. Um, and, um, and when the pandemic happened, my mother was locked down in the hospital and she had been rushed to the hospital for an emergency. And then the hospital was closed. So she couldn't see my brother or my sister um, for many, many, many months. Um, but my mother, you know, treated all this as just one of another, you know, tribulations in in her life. And she was um, she she's a power of strength for me um, when I needed advice, needed strength. I can still call my mother, you know, call on my mother's help. That's great. Uh, well, the Benjamin. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, Benjamin also asked, since the publication of Wild Swans, has anyone mentioned in the book found and contacted you? In the bo book, oh, sorry. In the book Who Wild Swans? Yes, yes. Who contacted you? He's asking, has anyone that, was, that you spoke about in the book 
has anyone reached out to you since then? Well, yeah, yes. What well, the thing is, um, I mean, you know, my friends have remained my friends. You know, Nana, who I went to the, the countryside with. I mean, the people I mentioned, they are they still my, my sister who's in Chengdu, and they still see each other like every every week. I mean, they were still, you know best friends to you know basically friends for life and I'm of course far away from them but I uh, now and then yes my mother's um, people from my mother's family um, from Dr. Shah's family and uh, Dr. Shah's um, you know, great-grandchildren now must be I mean they got in touch um and some of them went abroad. I mean, you know, got saw the book. I mean, all my books are banned in China. And of course, mm -hmm. um, and but they went abroad, they came abroad, they they knew about the book and they got in touch, quite a few of them, people I didn't know. I mean, the one I did know were always in touch, are always in touch. Mm. That's nice. So, so it's um, very nice. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. I have an interesting question for you from Carol. Um, she says she loved wild swans. Mm -hmm. And how would you feel about it being made into a movie? And if it were to happen, would you have any ideas about who the director or actors might be for the stories of your family? Well, you know, it's 30 years now since the publication of Wild Swans. <laughs> I mean, numerous directors or producers have approached me and have tried. Um, and, um, and I have a particular favorite Chinese um, director um, who directed Raise the Red Lantern and uh, To Live. Um, um, and he's very good. We were the same generation. And um, we, we were very keen to cooperate. But I think um, distributors, Hollywood distributors are the main, well, I mean, they now has been able to find distributors because they were all, of course, afraid of Chinese retrib retribution. Um, and mm. so all the attempts have um, not got very far. I've not got very far, some have got very far, but have not been able to cross this hurdle. Wow, interesting. Okay, so a couple of people have asked, what's next for you? A new book, do you have another book coming or some other project? Well, I, I think I should always be writing, of course. I mean, at the moment, I'm try, just trying to, um, um, to um, just wait and see, do some research and see which is um, which is the which I would like to write, because each of my I, I said earlier these three books are like a, a trilogy of modern China and its main characters, but I didn't plan it that way. I mean, it's always one book leading to another. And after Wild Swans, Mao, a biography of Mao, seemed to be the obvious subject because, you know, I, I grew up under him, I left China when I was 26. So, and, um, and I, you know, he dominated my earlier life. I saw him turning China upside down. And so I just wanted to find out more, more about him. And yet, you know, he was still worshipped. He is still worshipped. And, you know, who is this man? I mean, that at the time I wanted to find out about him. So I embarked on this project with, um, with my husband, with John. Um, by the way, if I... I can I just tell one, one story, one or two stories yes. about our research and I just earlier I said I, we interviewed nearly everybody who had interesting dealings with Mao and the one person was Imelda Marcos do you remember this former Filipino yeah. first lady who had thousands of pairs of shoes and um, yeah. <laughs> we, we interviewed him <laughs> we interviewed him and he's um she she was going very strong. She, she was uh, uh, talking very animatedly, um, and she was, um, and she, she, she's 
flattered us. She said she can see this biography of Mao is a perfect combination um, with the um, Eastern heart, meaning me, and the Western intellect. <laughs> my husband and then, then he said and then she batted her eyelid furiously you know at uh, John uh, and uh, then she said to me you know don't you think that western men simply don't understand us eastern women and so um, John said have you come across any western men who understand you and she said only one person Richard Nixon. <laughs> mm. Did you check out her shoes in the interview? Oh, she, yes, yeah, she had these um, uh, sort of artificial shoes dotted around her flat, and that's her sense of humor. <laughs> but anyway, you know, talking about Nixon, because when Mao, um, one, before Mao died, the person he most wanted to see was Richard Nixon. And oh. he, he invited Nixon to go to China for the second time. And he asked Emil, also asked Imelda Marcos to convey the message to Nixon, which she did. And, um, and, um, and, and so and anyway, Mao had a flirtatious relationship with Imelda. Mao was another womanizer. And uh, when, uh, when he saw Imelda, you know, he sort of, uh, he picked up her hand and kissed it, and which we all saw on the screen, because in those days, there were all films were banned. I mean, we, the only films were some newsreels. So Mao meeting Imelda Marcos, and we, I was very struck. I remember very well the moment I saw this. We were all we were aghast because in the Cultural Revolution, if anyone sort of kissed another woman's hand or something to start making some gesture of gallantry would have been condemned as, um, as bourgeois and subjected to denunciation meetings. And in fact, Mao's photographer was so scared and he didn't dare to take a photograph. But the newsreel camera was rolling and recorded this rare moment. Uh, so we had, big, we had a good picture in our Mao biography. Another man, another interview, which I was, was great fun, was with um, Monbuto. He was the tyrant of Zaire and had an interesting, uh, had a relationship, a very interesting relationship with Mao. Um, Zaire Congo, now Congo. And um, um, when we, um, I, we wanted to interview him, but we, um, we, uh, we, we couldn't go to Congo. Um, but then we were in Hong Kong after doing interviews in China. And um, John was in the bathroom reading his local paper. And he said, guess who is in this same hotel? Um, it's Mobutu. And shall we try to see him? And I said, John, I've done two month interviews. I'm exhausted. I'm going to the hair salon. So I went to the hotel hair salon and 10 minutes later, who but Mobutu strutted in. And he, he sat, you know, just like a, a quite close to me. He was under this hair thing and which blew steams into his hair. And he had bits of towels around his, uh, towels around his neck and cotton wools around his hair. And he was trapped. So I was able to approach him when I was led to have my hair rinsed. And I asked for an interview and we got a very nice interview. <laughs> That's a great story. Thank you. <laughs> oh, so, well, there's many more questions. So let me, we're um, a little long on time. Is it okay if we go a little oh, bit longer? Okay. Now, Stephanie yeah, would like yes. to know, um, when was the last time you were in China? And what are your perceptions now of the current China? Well, after the biography of Mao was published, the Chinese edition was published in, 19, in 2006. I lost my freedom to travel in China. And, and, and thanks to the help of the British government, um, I, was, I was allowed to go for 15 days a year to just to visit my mother 
not to see anybody. So which is why some of the old friends I hadn't seen for a long time. I, I couldn't see. Um, and uh, um, and and it was just you know all this the application um, process was just agonizing you know never sure whether even these fifteen days were um, okay. The last time I was in China was twenty eighteen, um, and then um, after that, um, you know things as we all know things became much more repressive and even dangerous. And the people um, have advised me not to go to China, then advised me not to go to China. So I didn't go in 2019. And, and then, then of course the, the, the pandemic broke out. And then I think um, things have got so bad. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I doubt whether I would, um, um, see my mother again. Oh, well, we hope that isn't true. We hope she can come visit you soon. So, well, uh, yes, when uh, you know, but um, but we, you know, I, I think we were quite we, we were prepared. As I said earlier, my mother is very strong, and I think she and I have um, or have long sort of taken this into account, and there is going to be some retribution I'm, I, I'm not I was not going to be allowed to get away with not only writing wild swans but a biography of Mao I mean that was the most um, um, dangerous book for for the regime which is still um, is is now even turning more towards Mao's direction did you ever feel physically threatened after you wrote the book about Mao? Definitely. Um, but, um, um, but as I said, you know, I was, um, I was prepared. In fact, when I, through the research and we found so many um, things and I knew how explosive they were. And Time Magazine said in the, in the review that this was an atom bomb of a book because we did discover so many things. And um, with all these things, um, I knew this was going to be a dangerous book, but um, I was, um, you know, I, I, I was saying to myself, it would just come as it what may, you know, I was not going to dwell on this thought. So I, I have not been dwelling on these on such thoughts. So um, Melody Yin wrote in, she said that she believes people in China deserve to know their, understand their real history and wonders what you do or how you can promote your work in Asia um, and beyond the Western audiences. Well, I when there was one well, my biography was first published when the Chinese, based, particularly when the Chinese edition came out, and in those years there was relative freedom, so there were so many pirated editions which I welcomed. I mean, you know, people bringing the books back to China, which is impossible now, and people download books and the comments, you know, hundreds of thousands. I and I, I could just do nothing but sitting in front of the screen and reading those. And, and of course, then since then, it, the control became tighter and tighter. Um, and it's impossible now. The internet had been totally wiped clean of um, any um, of, of any um, of any thing that is that doesn't conform to the party line. I think only recently, as um, you know, it's it's now into a law um, that it's a criminal offense to um, to you know basically to give another version about what they call revolutionary leaders and revolutionary heroes because other people also began to question the, the party myth. Um, and uh, so that's criminal now. And a young man, I think recent, just, just the other day, had just been um, forced to make a TV confession 
because he wrote something that was deemed of of irrespects disrespectful to the to the to some army soldiers or something like but you know a humiliation of of be making public confession on the screen on screen and a, a very young man using social media mm-hmm. um another question is did um this is the last one um mm-hmm. did the ban on your books make you more motivated to keep writing and telling stories despite the bans and despite the bans, definitely, but I mean, that's not a motivation. You know, I, I love writing when I was a child. I just, I would just love writing um, with, with or without their ban. And because after all, it's only in mainland China, the book is banned. I mean, my books have been translated into nearly 40 languages. I mean, it, they are all over the world. Um, I mean, I, um, so I, um, um I, I should just go on writing. Um, yes, I, um, yeah, I think that uh, we're running out of time. <laughs> so, yeah, well, you know, I've, I've come to realize in reading your books and hearing you talk today what, and hearing people's reactions, what a treasure you are and your work is to the world to understand better what's happening in China without the, um, without any of the, um, retelling stories that aren't quite true, right? Um, so, well, I'm very so th- pleased that I have been able to put some put some records straight. I mean, the books are banned, but they are published, banned in mainland China, but they're published elsewhere, and a record is there. I mean, I, I believe, you know, my, the eyewitnesses talk to me, you know, not only ab- abroad, um, or these uh, statesmen who met Mao, or, you know, whatever people who, who had interest in dealings with Mao, um, but, but um, you know, in China, people in Mao's circle, historical witnesses, I mean, they chose to talk to me because they wanted to preserve their bit of truth, their bit mm-hmm. of the history they witnessed, the truth. Um, and so I think that's, um, I'm, very, I'm very pleased and the books are written, uh, they are there, the record is there. So people, anyone who wants can, um, can read them. They've been really informative to me and my friends and I um, really wanna thank you for them. Um, and I'm sure everybody feels the same way. You know, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and especially Young Cheng for um, sharing her time with us today. Um, Before we go, I wanna let you know that we have two more programs in the month of March. Um, On March 17th, we have an art docent program on post-impressionist masterpieces from the Musée d'Orsay. And on March 25th, we have a virtual tour of Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Arkansas. Um, You can find all of our upcoming programs on our website at alamedafriends.com. And while you're there, please consider making a donation so we can continue bringing you events like this one with Young Change today. Uh, Very special thanks to the team who produced these programs, David Beal, Karen Butter, and Karen Romer. And a very, very special thank you to Young Chang for sharing her evening with us. Um, Thank you all for joining us on this Saturday morning, and we wish you a good weekend ahead. Thanks very much.